Okay, so uh, thanks uh, uh, for joining us. We'll uh, give people just a minute to get settled in, but um, it, so I will give my pitch for this uh, overall series and what we're trying to do. Uh, basically, uh, uh, my theory of the case is that um, we now understand that in teaching, we learn, uh, our students learn better when uh, we are explicit about some of the things we're doing. So historically, we've expected students to learn a lot of things about being a lawyer by osmosis. Um, and they, and it turns out that telling students uh, things that uh, explicitly in certain ways or structuring things in certain ways makes many more students able to learn the stuff that uh, people like, like us largely succeeded in doing by osmosis. Um, and so uh, the idea is to take that for teachers ourselves, right? That some of the things that, uh, that we learn to do as teachers, um, we pick up from people around us, but it would be much more helpful if we could talk explicitly about what it is that we're doing and why. Um, and so people could learn from that and adapt things that work for them as teachers. So that is kind of the core uh, thesis of this series. And so we have lots of different people, um, uh, HLS alums working all around the country in various different uh, jobs uh, who have something interesting and useful to say uh, to help to help each other in this process. So I'm quite delighted uh, to have uh, uh, three of those people here today, um, all of them uh, highly qualified, and I don't want to take up too much of your time in introductions. So I'm just going to uh, ask, uh, we're going to have the presentations in alphabetical order. Uh, and then some discussion, including time for audience questions, which can be submitted through the Q&A. Um, and this, uh, this webinar is being recorded and will be available on the HLS website after the fact. So um, with that, I'm gonna ask uh, Kendra to take it away. Awesome, thank you so much, Rebecca, and thank you so much to my co-panelists. I'm really excited to be talking about this. Um, I think the reason I was, uh, sort of included here. Oh no, is... something happened. I, 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 can you check your sound? Oh. Um, I'm showing up as speaking. No. Okay. Now, now you're definitely muted. Okay. Um, any better? Oh no, we heard you in the practice session. Um, so, uh, Just Okay, I, rather Rebecca. than uh, do this, this is the classic Zoom. Um, maybe if you could disconnect and reconnect and I'll just ask Jack to go first while you do that, if that's okay. Sorry. Rebecca, I hesitate to say this, but I, oh, well, you can't hear me. Um, Jack, go ahead. Yeah, sorry. Can you hear me, Rebecca? All right, uh, all right, Jack, would you, yes. <laughs> could you get uh, us started? Can you hear me? Can you hear me? Can you hear me? Okay. Uh, okay. Uh, Kim, Kendra, can you hear me? Yes. I can hear you, Jack. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Great. So this is um, something that I've thought a lot about, and I talk a lot about with my students. And so it's a real pleasure to be able to, and, and privilege to be able to talk about it in this context, because, because I think you know, part really, really a lot of what. Uh, uh, Rebecca is talking about is intentionality and being explicit um, about what you're doing. And that's something that we, we you know, is really fundamental to clinical teaching. Um, so reflection and um, assessment and checking in are uh, core to what many, if not most clinicians do. And it's a, it's a major part of our pedagogical approach. Uh, for me, I want to distinguish between the professions and the concept of professionalism, because I think they're they're actually uh, quite different um, and 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 distinct. And you know, professionalism comes out of this concept of professions, but then it, um, I think, in, in many ways, becomes corrupted. So, what, you know, what is a profession? You know, Roscoe Pound described it as pursuing a learned art as a common uh, a pursuit in the spirit of public service. Um, and uh, and I think that makes some sense um, that there is a spirit of public service built into being uh, being in a profession, right? Um, Howard Gardner and Lee Shulman in a piece I assign a lot uh, to find professions as individuals who are given a certain amount of prestige and autonomy. 
in return for performing for society a set of services in a disinterested way. So there's a public interest uh, aspect there that goes beyond the interest of the professional. Um, but notice that you know these scholars are also talking about prestige and autonomy. Um, and, and another word for that might be power. Um, so you know we can talk about what makes a uh, uh, what what makes what makes a profession versus uh, you know just a job somebody does uh, uh, public service or service both to a client and to the broader society having a unique body of theory knowledge specialized skills and practices uh, that the professionals do uh, one that really when I read this piece and when I started thinking about professionalism really struck me was the ability to make judgments in the face of uncertainty, right? And I talk with that about my students a lot. You know, they don't pay us hundreds of dollars an hour to look something up and then just say, here's the rule, go do it. Uh, most of the time, it's figuring out something where there is no clear answer and you're in uncertain waters. Uh, continuing education. And finally, being part of a professional community that is self-regulated, right? So uh, ethical rules and fiduciary duties attached to what professionals do. Um, and that leads to standards of quality and licensing. Uh, and, you know, Gardner and Shulman sort of declare that their purpose, that the purpose of these uh, standards of quality are to ensure quality by controlling access, right? So you control access, that that's how you can ensure quality, right? But to me, you know, the barriers like the bar, uh, the moral character application and other things, uh, and the concept of professionalism itself end up having less laudable effects, right? So they make it more expensive and difficult to join the profession. Uh, they, they drive up prices by restricting supply and end up restricting supply and make it hard for people to get access to legal services. And they make space for discrimination based on class, race, religion, or other characteristics. And, uh, and, and this is uh, talked about a lot in the literature. Um, so for me, the concept of professionalism is as much about these barriers as it is about the characteristics of a profession and, and, and being a member of a profession, right? So on the one hand, I see professionalism, and this is something we talk with, uh, with the students uh, all the time, uh, as standards of conduct that foster effective lawyering. Um, and that might be something like uh, using, using uh, uh, getting someone's name right. Um, but it also is a commitment to public service. So on the one hand, that's one way to think of professionalism. On the other hand, uh, it, it is often used or deployed as a set of norms that serve to shore up barriers to entry, um, having nothing to do with quality, but to preserve an elitist or an exclusionary concept of who should be a lawyer. So to me, cultivating professionalism with my students, first and foremost means helping them understand the difference between these two concepts and how to navigate the line between them. Um, and unfortunately, that line is sometimes very hard to see. Uh, and it and and um, and so how do we deal with this in the clinic? Well, one, again, we're very explicit about talking about what is professionalism. We're very intentional about it and, and how to use this concept uh, to be more effective and how to navigate around some of the harmful norms that are built into the concept. Um, and so there's a lot of strategies around that, right? So on a nuts and bolts, uh, on a nuts and bolts level, uh, a, a lot of the strategies have to do with simply sh showing and demonstrating respect and competence. And, you know, again, the concept of respect can sometimes, again, be deployed uh, in a really harmful way, right? And I'm not talking about that, right? So someone might say, uh, well, you're you're advancing. You, you know, uh, some someone is is behaving in a, in a racist way towards towards uh, a lawyer of color in court, and if the lawyer of color points it out, uh, then they are seen as disrespectful, right? And that's a way that is harmful. But but something we talk about in the clinic that's probably a pretty uncontroversial way to show respect might be uh, making sure you pronounce people's names correctly and remember their names. Um, you know, and we say that's your job not the other person's job to get it right. Um, don't assume you know someone's pronouns, uh, you know, be sure and find out what people's pronouns are and then don't forget them, get them right. That is on you as somebody, it's a basic sign of respect um, is, to, is to get their name and their, and their pronouns right and not to, and not to make a bunch of assumptions. Um, uh, we have practices for preparing for meetings, right? So come prepared to the meeting, if you have a question, go as far as you can towards figuring the, out the answer to the question before you ask somebody to spend time uh, trying to answer that question, whether that's a client, a colleague, uh, a peer, or a supervisor. 
uh, we spend a lot of time on getting correspondence right. And we have these conversations about email. You know, the reason emojis were invented is because email strips text restricts uh, email strips out all nuance, uh, all emotion, uh, uh, and and ends up becoming a really blunt tool. So we spend a lot of time using language to try to bring in and 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 talk about our intentions and and signal respect to people um, if we can, right? So all these strategies help to build credibility. Um, but many other strategies have to do with the concept of service and morality that's built into um, that's built into this idea of law as a profession, right? So one is we're constantly exploring how our work impacts the public interest. I run a, a, a law and technology clinic. So we do media work for journalists. We work with creators. Uh, we, we work with startups um, and we work with a lot of nonprofits on, on, on consumer privacy and other consumer rights and, and, and more broadly, freedom of expression and civil liberty stuff. But it's all about tech, right? So when students come in, they're thinking tech, that's just neutral. Like that's not a public interest thing one way or another. Um, and we spend the semester exploring that. And at the end of the semester, they say, oh my God, I did not, did not really realize that. And now I have a new conception of the public interest. But to me, that is a big part of being professional or having a sense of professionalism. We talk about civility and how that concept is again often deployed in harmful ways. You're not being civil even while someone is, you know, misgendering you, or even while someone is uh getting your name wrong, or even while someone is saying, um, oh, you shouldn't dress that way. You should actually dress in a way that's totally uh totally foreign to you and actually uh and actually really makes you extremely uncomfortable, right? Um, and so civility is um, is a really dangerous concept in my view. Um, and I think back about this, mo the most w amazing speech Leah Littman gave uh, at the commencement at UCI Law School in 2019. And one thing she said just almost made me fall out of my seat. Uh, she said a lot of things in that speech. It's really wonderful. She said, she said do not let the legal profession's comfort with the status quo and clubby networks shackle you to the way things are and prevent you from doing good, from doing justice in this world, right? And you, you know, we, you can see that, you know, be, being, being civil, being civil is, is, you know, you obviously it's probably not a good idea to shout and rant and rave, uh, it, you know, whether you're in a negotiation or in court, um, but at the same time, you might need to challenge the way things are. And that leads me to kind of, I think, a really important um, concept about professionalism. We talk about this a lot, actually, at UCI Law. This is the way we have a, a year-long legal profession uh, course. We don't teach professional responsibility. We teach legal profession. And it brings in empirical work about and sociology, about the law. And one of the, one of the things that people study, you know, the legal profession uh, talk about is um, is the fact that it really the concepts of professionalism really differ and diverge from one area of the practice to the other. So this is a really diverse, diverse, heterogeneous type of practice, and people learn about a lot of how professionalism is defined, or what people learn about it is actually learned from observing others in their workplace, whatever setting that might be, and so we try to model a humane workplace. We try to model the kind of workplace that, um, that sort of uh, builds the, 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 the values of professionalism around, uh, uh, around um, uh, fostering effective lawyering and a commitment to public service um, rather, than, um, rather than sort of, this is, this is how people expect you to act and expect you to be. Um, and so we try to model a humane workplace that respects boundaries, uh, that's intentional about the impact of our work, and reflective about how our experiences are transforming us. Um, and um, and I think that's, you know, even though that's not about how to dress, how to act, that's absolutely about what professionalism is about. And I just want to conclude my initial comments um, with the 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 observation that you know it, a, a ton of the clinic experience is about finding one's identity as a lawyer. Um, a lot of our students have a very tough time reconciling their pre-law school identity with what they think or what they've been told an lawyer, a lawyer should act like or be like. 
Um, and the, the truth is that they can absolutely be themselves while still being effective as a lawyer and doing all things that lawyers do. Um, if they, if they can, um, sometimes it might take work to find the right workplace and the right setting, right? And so I say, we're trying to model uh, a workplace where you are respected, where you, uh, where you are trusted and, um, and, and that is going to, that is going to give you the uh, the freedom and the and the um, the opportunity to be yourself. Um, and so, and so, you know, checking your identity at the door is a bad idea, uh, and and it leads to a, a really unhappy career. Um, and so, um, so those are some of my some of my initial thoughts. I'm I'm really excited to to hear from Kendra and Kim because. Uh, you know, I haven't talked as much about, um, um, there's a lot of other things we can talk about, and particularly the way that this concept of professionalism ends up, you know, boxing people in and and really harming people. Uh, um, so maybe they'll talk about that. I don't know. But uh, but thanks for, um, thanks for uh, uh, the opportunity to chat about this. And um, hopefully, Rebecca, your, uh, uh, your sound is working now. Yes, and uh, let me apologize to Kendra for uh, screwing that one up, uh, but uh, please, uh, Kendra, go ahead. Sure. Rebecca, we good? Yes. Awesome. All right. Um, thank you so much. And yeah, uh, yeah, really excited to be here uh, for this conversation. Um, I think, you know, part of the reason I think I was asked to be on this panel is because a couple of years ago, I wrote a piece on teaching professionalism that may be like one of the pieces that people actually like has like impacted many of my colleagues teaching um, or people tell me it's impacted their teaching, you know. Um, and so, you know, I want to note maybe as a starting point that I, uh, you know, uh, to uh, to paraphrase, um, <laughs> I was going to say the oldest, whitest dude of all, but all of those things are maybe uh, uh, subject to subject to debate. But I come to very professionalism, not to praise it. Um, even as I think about teaching it and how to teach it in my everyday everyday work. So I want to read a little bit from the essay that I wrote a couple of years ago and then talk a little bit about what that looks like in practice. Um, and the essay is called Care, Not Respect Teaching Professionalism. As someone who has to articulate to students what clear standards look like in a profession that lacks them, I always worry about using the word professionalism. What is professionalism and how does one teach it? At its best, professionalism encompasses a number of small everyday tasks that I associate with high quality work product or making life easier for those around us. Um, common tasks that fall under the professionalism umbrella include wearing the right uh, clothes to court, reviewing final work product to make sure the formatting is right or it doesn't have typos or showing up on time uh, and with an agenda to meetings. So what could be wrong with that? Um, in so many legal spaces, professionalism comes to stand in for the unnameable, the, the je ne sais quoi. Um, it means looks like us or acts like us. Professionalism implicitly relies, as Jack was saying, um, that's not in the piece, uh, on, the, on the stereotypes about who belongs in the law and who does not. And I list a couple of examples, which I can talk through but if, if folks want, but I, I want to just sort of get to the heart of the piece and so I can sort of share what it looks like for me on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, unprofessional becomes the catch-all for not acting like me when deployed by white, straight, often male supervisors. Professionalism is so racist, ableist, classist, and sexist that it feels like it can't be rescued from itself. If a student dares to ask why these things matter, professionalism is usually framed in terms of respect for legal institutions. We stand when the judge enters uh, the courtroom because it is respectful. We wear a suit to court because we respect the institution. But as someone who is often disrespected or harmed by legal institutions, I find it hard to act from this frame. Call me petty, but legal institutions so rarely go out of their way to respect me or the people I care about. Performing respect for them doesn't get me out of bed in the morning. But over time, I've come to believe that there are skills at the heart of professionalism that might be worth saving. And as a teacher, I'm always trying to balance teaching the way things should be with the way that they are. Um, so when I have to teach it, I try to talk about professionalism as a way of caring about those around us. Um, professionalism at its best is an act of love and belief towards those we work with rather than a set of behavioral standards we have to live up to. We review final documents for typos because taking the time to produce high quality work product shows our clients that they matter to us. 
we send agendas and we show up on time because we care about those we're meeting with and not wasting their time as a way to express that care. And then when those norms do not communicate care, when they do not succeed in making our people feel cared for, we can let them go. So, you know, I think in this piece and in my teaching more generally, I think I often reflect on sort of professionalism as actually, I think something Jack was sort of framing as kind of the thing of the professional, kind of making judgments in the space of uncertainty. And I think we often talk about professionalism as if it's sort of, you know, oh, like it's about wearing the right clothes. Um, and I think that's true, but that, that often comes with the assumption that wearing the right clothes means wearing fancy enough clothes. And in reality, there are plenty of circumstances in which wearing the right clothes does not mean wearing a suit, right? I actually think about an, an incident is a strong word, but a time earlier this semester where this poor student of mine actually read the requirements and procedures we put out in the clinic. It's like 35 pages um, and showed up to the first client meeting wearing like a jacket and a, a tie. Um, it was on Zoom. And I was like, oh no. Like the student did exactly what he was supposed to. And yet actually the vibe sort of the, my assessment of what was going to be most useful for the connection with that client was that it might actually make the client more uncomfortable to be sort of confronted with a person in a suit and tie um, than just a sort of button down shirt. And also the other student and I had sort of shown up in kind of relatively, you know, work a day clothing and it would have sort of, I think, created a weird dynamic. So I asked the student to hop off Zoom and just change real quick, uh, which, which he did, uh, which was very professional of him. But I think the reason I tell this story is to say that, you know, I think that I, you know, at its best, it's a professionalism can be about adaptation to like actually creating the environment where people are going to be successful and that kind of making judgments in the space of uncertainty about sort of what to do and how to show people that you care for them. Um, but when we are urged to teach it, it is often through the lens of teaching the rule rather than the practice, right? It's often through this desire to say, oh, like you wear a suit or, you know, you do these particular things, not through the lens of why or under what circumstances that's the appropriate thing to do and what circumstances it's not. And I think this both leads to, you know, people sometimes making the wrong call, right? Like in terms of what's going to make folks feel more comfortable, but also the kinds of like alienation from a, a set of practices that only serves particular groups that, you know, I talk about in the piece and Jack already mentioned as well, right? You know, that if the rules of professionalism are such that they are unmeetable for you because of your gender, or unmeetable for you because of your race, you know, then it's easy and very reasonable to say that the whole thing is crap, like get rid of it. Um, when you're taught the rules and not actually kind of any structure for making decisions or how to think about it. Um, so I think, you know, as I approach it in my work at the clinic, um, when working with students on it, it is, I do try to teach it from the sort of the way in which it, from a position of care for those, for folks around us. And also from a position of folks finding out kind of what works for them effectively. I actually just got done meeting with a student where we were talking about objective writing um, and sort of this practice of writing kind of objective memos that sort of summarize the law even handedly on issues where we are deeply personally invested in the outcome, you know, where it is very difficult to be objective and I feel pretty much the same way about objectivity as I do about professionalism, which is like, I want to dump, like get rid of the whole thing at the same time that I know that actually there are parts of it that I have to teach students in order for them to do their jobs well. And so part of this is about finding ways to frame those tools so they resonate with students um, and resonate with in the context in which students will be called upon to give them and do not inherently assume that like more formal, more respectful, like sort of ways of engaging are inherently better or more appropriate, because that is part of what sort of um, meet, that is part of the structure that means that unprofessional is sort of like, doesn't act like me, you know, doesn't, doesn't look like me um, in an, in a profession that as Jack mentioned is so uh, like status driven and hierarchical. So those are my opening thoughts. Um, really very interested to hear your yours, Kim. Thank you so much, Kendra. I really um, appreciated your comments and I, I take the, the professionalism as care to heart. So my name is Kim Thomas. 
I am, I teach in litigation clinics. So I do um, represent kids and adults who are accused of crimes and also who are serving life without parole and long sentences. And so when I think about a classic um, professionalism, um, you know, there's a Matthew McConaughey film poster for a movie and uh, he's a lawyer and he's sitting on the hood of a black Cadillac, sort of legs splayed in a black suit. And I think that that's the archetype, right? The archetype of professionalism is, um, especially in litigation, which is my area, um, the sort of fierce, go it alone. You know, you've got your chain mail armor, you're gonna slay your dragon. You know, you sort of, that's the archetype that we have. And so the work that I, um, you know, in my comments, want to talk about is sort of how, what's the counterweight? What's our counterweight to professionalism as a norm? And how do we redefine that? And I was going to speak with respect to students and themselves first. I feel like that's a piece that we're, um, that often isn't talked about in professionalism, as well as clients and um, the public good or social justice. Um, but really to, to front and center um, professionalism as self-care, for students, um, I think that in developing their own identities, uh, we need to help students learn that that's part of an aspect of being a professional in our modern world as a, as a lawyer. And um, there was a, an article last fall from the American Psychological Association that looked at college students. Um, and it looked at students in the 2020 to 2021 21 school year. And so those students that they're studying in this study are our students now, right? Like those are the students who have come to us in law school. And 60% of those college students met the criteria for at least one mental health problem um, and from a Healthy Mind study, which looked at those. And then in another national survey, about three quarters of the students per, uh, reported uh, moderate or severe psychological distress. And the article talks about faculty members, their faculty members as first responders. Um, and I thought that was such an interesting way to describe some of the work that we do with students and to think about that in the context of professionalism. Um, and as I know the three of you know, and um, um, the law school typically doesn't make things better for our students uh, who come to us from college. Uh, and in fact, the stress and isolation of law school can exacerbate the struggles that they're having when they come in. Uh, they can help uh, students, they can make students worry that they are, quote, unprofessional by getting help or seeking care for themselves. And so uh, I really want to sort of dig into this archetype of the warrior that prevents students from seeing themselves in the profession. That if that's the archetype, um, if that's what a good lawyer is, well, then I'm not a good lawyer, right? Is the sort of thing that we're telling them implicitly by having that archetype, right? It does damage to our students' self of their own competency, their own efficacy as a legal professional. Um, and so it really undermines their ability to go out and do the work that we're asking them to do and that we want them to do successfully. Um, and also they're worried about entry into the bar and what that means for, what does it mean if I seek um, seek care or seek help, um, especially with respect to character and fitness. And so, um, you know, Rebecca had asked us to think really concretely about what are some things to, to say, uh, you know, uh, and so I think some professional level responses, uh, the American Bar Association Committee on Disability Rights uh, issued a report in January looking at the use of character and fitness questions and whether it asked about mental health and 37 states and DC do include one or more questions referencing mental health status of an applicant. Um, some of those are very um, capacious, right? So they ask, you know, do you have a diagnosis or existence of a mental health condition that could affect your ability to practice law or whether you've sought inpatient or outpatient treatment? And so, and some of them are narrower, right? So what uh, has the role or uh, the condition or impairment been used in a defense of a legal proceeding, right? So, so a little more narrower. Um, 14 states now don't consider a candidate's mental health status in evaluating the fit character fitness. And then a series of about seven other states ask those narrower questions, but not the broader questions. And so, you know, what are we as a profession doing? Where are we moving to um, and thinking about what's important to be a professional, right? To be and to gain entry into our profession. 
Um, at law schools, I know that a lot of law schools now have an embedded psychologist. We have we do here at our school, and I think a lot of schools have, have moved in that direction. I'm thinking about how to train faculty to um, be responsive to our students, um, and that's uh, you know really. Um, modeling that at the law school level about what a professional school looks like and um, what's available there is, is really a good push against those archetypes. Um, at a classroom level, um, you know, the literature on professional identity talks about the importance of mentors and mentoring and being a model of the professional that you want your students to be. They see you as the, the standard, right? Um, in all classrooms, you know, what can we do? So where do students learn about what's important in our course? They learn that in the syllabus. And so what do they see in the syllabus? Do they see, so my syllabus has a statement on student well-being, right? And I'm sure many of yours do too. So that um, students understand that that is part of what their professional role is. That's understanding this is, this is an element of what's important for me to learn in this class and that it acknowledges uh, the impact that the course might have on them or the experience might have on them in the clinics. Um, and it encourages them to you know, be courageous if they need help. Um, and so things like that can help us define the curriculum, literally, um, of what their professional school is going to have. Um, obviously, being familiar with resources, um, you know, stopping and um, making sure that students' poor performance isn't just poor performance, right? That it's not something else there and just sort of um, being that um, careful eye. Um, in the clinic specifically, um, we talk a lot about this in the context of lawyer competence, right? So what is your competence as a legal professional? So we work with um, teens, teenagers who have experienced incredible, uh, many of them, life trauma. Um, they have experienced neglect and abuse. They're um, incarcerated. And so um, we represent people that have served 40, 50 years in prison. And so those, uh, you know, in encouraging students to understand the inequitable and oppressive systems that our clients operate within, um, that can take a toll on students and to help them understand what those boundaries are, what they can do as lawyers, what they have capacity to do, and what they don't have capacity to do that they're not um, equipped for and is not part of our profession, um, and that they they really can't um, can't take on and aren't responsible for and can't be can't be responsible for. And so thinking about what those barriers of the profession are, and you know really their ability to um, problem solve is, you know, is limited in a, in a, um, in a frustrating, uh, for sure, um, but also in a way that, that is important for them to understand as part of who they are as a, as a lawyer. Um, you know, I, I know that lots of other classes and clinicians do, um, you know, things within the course room to think about uh, what it looks like to be a professional, so sessions on vicarious trauma, or compassion fatigue and thinking about that in the context of gaining professionalism and you know doing um, you know being truly transparent as a teacher about why you're talking about that and why it's important and you know being your own best trying to model or you know be transparent when you're a bad model <laughs> for your students um, you know I think are things that we need to be thinking about in the context of what are we helping students, um, you know, be as professionals and sort of create in this image as um, professionals to their own selves. Um, with respect to others, uh, I think, you know, we can think about um, it's, you know, uh, the, the pushback on the archetype is maybe as a professional, as someone who loves or someone who has, um, you know, real uh, human connection with um, clients and other people. Um, and one of my colleagues really loves the, the etymology of the word attorney. Um, it comes from an old French term where you put yourself uh, in someone else's place. And so you're putting your, you are acting in the shoes of another. And so you have to sort of be able to deeply empathize and care for the person that you're representing. This, you know, and so that's really um, the norm of professionalism that you know, we wanna sort of turn, turn the old one on its head for to be able to see clients 
and their full selves to recognize their agency, um, to not think that we are, you know, the actor for them, but they really have their own agency and life experiences that um, help them successfully navigate um, the situations in which they find themselves. Um, you know, for others, I, you know, there's the standard, uh, you know, you can be an effective lawyer and not be a jerk, right? <laughs> like, you know, I think, and that's a little bit of pushing back on the archetype, right? Like, I think sometimes students come to a litigation clinic and think the jerkier I am, the more effective I am, right? You know, and so um, that one's, you know, uh, it's, it would be funny if it weren't true. Like we buy into the norms that that's, that's what it is to be an effective lawyer. And, you know, we can talk about, you know, like you can go to court and have two different prosecutors and one is honest with you and one isn't. And, you know, what impact does that have on your reputation? What impact does that have on your ability to trust this person and to think about, you know, to reflect on um, what those norms look like? Um, Lastly, professionalism is a search for social justice. Um, you know, you've both uh, touched on this, obviously. There's a, a, a doctor who writes on medical professionalism and, re and defines that in respect to the public good, right? So what is the public good in law? The public good in law is justice, right? It's um, thinking that of that as a key component of what we want our students to work towards in law school. And one, um, you know, small example, might be to think about when students are writing uh, legal pleadings, right? So law is such a status quo profession and it uh, largely argues, you know, your arguments largely uh, center on what is, right? Um, and so here, here's a place you can think about, well, you know what, the rules of professional conduct, what do they tell us? Like rule 3.1 tells us that lawyers are supposed to and have permission to create doctrinal change. Like they have a, they have permission to extend and modify and reverse the existing law. And that's part of what our professional rules account for, like this change to the status quo. Um, and that's built into our profession. Like we wanna try to recapture um, that. And so um, some of the work that we're doing now is pushing the, man, the age of um, JOOP bars uh, Michigan just passed it uh, last summer to 18 instead of 17. And so, um, you know, thinking about what that change looks like, how do you push or reverse or extend what the law is and thinking that that is an integral piece of um, what professionalism is. So those are my initial thoughts. Thanks so much. Great. So thank you so much. And um, as we uh, start a conversation um, uh, among the three of you, um, something that I wanna pull out of all three of your comments uh, is this question. Um, so what would you say to a colleague who says, uh, my sole aim is to help students succeed in the world in which they find themselves. Um, you know, most of us can't actually change the world. So my way of protecting students um, because I care for them is to emphasize the presentation of the traditional version of a professionalized self, refraining from speaking about one's own emotions, speaking and dressing in a certain way. I'm thinking here of like Tressie McMillan Cotton's article about, um, you know, dressing up as a strategy uh, to, to avoid uh, judgment that would otherwise, or, or to, to, you know, decrease the impact of judgment. So, uh, you know, how would you talk to that person? Because I've definitely encountered that person and, you know, uh, they, they, they really do believe that that's the best way uh, to, to help students. I can go first if it's helpful. Um, uh, I have a lot of thoughts for that person. Um, so I think the first thing I would offer as a question, because uh, I am a clinician, is have you asked students about that approach? What do your students tell you about the value of that strategy for teaching professionalism? Um, what kinds of questions do they have? You know, have they, what kinds of feedback are you offered? Because I would suspect that for most of those folks, um, they have gotten feedback that that actually doesn't work particularly well. Um, but, or if they haven't, you know, that they may not have had conversations with students about that. And I think, but I, what I would say there is also that I think um, one challenge of those kinds of approaches is that folks adapt those strategies without ever naming the thing that they are doing, right? I think it is actually quite a bit different to say, I'm like this, this 
uh, profession sucks and it's super hierarchy driven and it's you know there's all these problems with it and I just want to equip you the best way I know how and that's by giving you these the tools to navigate these particular situations in the ways that are least likely, least likely to upset the status quo and that's what I'm going to do. Um, I think that requires a level of sort of honesty and ownership over the strategy that one is choosing that I think is uh, isn't always present and I think is way less damaging if someone is able to articulate that as their goal and their intention as opposed to sort of adapting that strategy without actually explaining that the you know the goal is to prepare students for the world which is rather than the world which ought to be um i'll offer one more brief thought and then i'll turn it over to my co-panelists who i suspect also have <laughs> answers to this um I, you know the other question i would ask them is you know you know that those strategies are not going to be effective or as effective for many of the students you work with. And if that is true and your your approach will disproportionately be like, you know, the approach of working with the sort of status quo of the legal profession is going to result in you basically telling whole groups of students that they cannot succeed at being lawyers in the model of what being lawyers look like looks like today. Is that something you feel comfortable with? Because I would not be able to sleep at night if that was my approach. And like, but you know, maybe there are people who can, you know, maybe they, you know, people make those decisions. And I think, you know, but for me, I think student agency in that decision is actually in some ways the most important for students to make their own decision about what professionalism looks like for them and to be supported in that. And that may look like for some students, you know, I think in, you know, uh, Dr. McMillan Cotton's work, Cotton's work, you know, she's talking about it, you know, the, the dressing up, right, as a strategy that people adopt for themselves, right? And there's such a difference between a strategy that people choose um, in a particular circumstance versus one that's forced upon them. And then I, you know, also would just want that colleague to really reckon with and really identify the consequences of such an approach on a longer scale. And, you know, have that be part of the story that they're willing like the, the sort of the things that they're willing to say um but those are those are my thoughts Kim, do you, want uh, you know i think my my reaction i, I really want to um uplift what kendra said about um the transparency of it right so um if in teaching that if they said to the student this is a descriptive of what our profession is now. And I appreciate that you want to achieve something different. And, you know, I think, you know, maybe I'm not the right colleague to help you get there, <laughs> but, but, you know, I'm going to, you know, help you operate within this norm because, you know, I, I think that that, um, but that's usually unsaid. Um, it's, it is only that this is what the profession is, right? right? And that's the part that is really, um, where students can't see themselves um, and fitting in where they can't see themselves in the profession. You know, I think if we, um, yes, if we were, if that colleague was, was extraordinarily transparent, you know, this is, uh, or that this is the model of, that of professionalism that I am choosing to adopt. And so I am, you know, giving you that model, um, but there are others out there. Um, but I think that our, our faults come when we aren't um, transparent with our students about, um, you know, the different choices that we're making as teachers and what we're teaching them about professionalism. Yeah, I mean, I think, so it was interesting because as I was formulating my answer, mm -hmm. I thought I want to hear what what Kendra and Kim have to say because they're probably going to say it better. Uh, and that's what happened. But, you know, because I was thinking, look, it's how you dress is a, is a tool in a toolbox of things you can do to be more or less effective. Um, but that has to work for you. I would never ask, I would actually, I would actually, uh, well, I would, I would never, I would never ask a student to uh, misgender themselves, for example. Um, I would never ask a student or tell or suggest that a student um, do anything to their hair that they that that they that to change their hair in any way. Um, that to me is, is really based, but, but the point is it's, you know, whatever, however we present ourselves, it, that's, that's one tool in, in, that might help us be effective in certain circumstances. Um, um, but it has to work for you. It has to be true to who you are 
And there is room for that. And if not, then it's our job. And this gets to the, the, the point I think is important to make for us as clinicians, but also as law teachers in any concepts, anybody affiliated with a law school, it has to work for you as a student, as a person um, to do that. And so uh, uh, Kendra, Kendra said, folks adapt these strategies without naming what they're doing. That's exactly what you need to do. And you need to have student agency, right? Um, but I also think um, it's our job to normalize pushing against some of these norms, right? If someone um, doesn't necessarily look like me um, or look like uh, uh, Matthew McConaughey um, in there with his, with his uh, we'll just say with his swagger, I could give some other adjectives, but um, um, you know, normalize pushing, pushing back against that. And I don't necessarily mean I, you know, uh, there, there's 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 so much uh, around race and gender uh, and um, and national origin um, or even religious presentation um, that is that is outside the norm of what of what people imagine lawyers to look like, right? And so it's our job to normalize pushing back against those norms and to normalize saying, no, I'm going to go into court uh, with a presentation that's authentic to me. Um, and, um, you know, even when we bring students in, we're normalizing, um, bringing in people who don't look like lawyers and we do get pushback sometimes. I'm sure you do as well like with, by some judges, other judges are like, okay, this is really neat. Let's, let's actually be more indulgent. That's always fun. But, um, but I think it's, it's, um, you know, by being intentional, by explicitly talking about these issues and by, um, by pushing back against um, some of these constraints, we can actually make room for tr for change so that we can help uh, uh, help make the law look like what it ought to be rather than what it is. Uh, so thank you. So um, I also want to uh, encourage anyone uh, who has a question to put it in the Q and A so so we can address it. Um, but one of the things I really want to uh, highlight is. Uh, Kendra's uh, framing of the issue as a question or, or a set of questions to that colleague, because I think that actually demonstrates the exact kind of sort of respect uh, that that we're talking about, that we're, we're asking a person to, you know, think something through anew, um, but in a way that that allows them to make the choices uh, that they want to make. Um, and, and I have to admit, my perspective on this is likely influenced by the fact that I've had mentors who have actually been very explicit about, um, you know, why they're giving this advice. So I'm probably more open to that because of that experience. Um, uh, so I also wanted to ask, um, so because uh, we've we've spent a, a bunch of time um, on, on, you know, things that are sort of uh, uh, emerge naturally or consciously out of clinic practice, we increasingly understand that every doctrinal course, even beyond the first year, is also about how to do law in a broader sense, which can affect what and how we teach. But we focused less on how every course is also about how to be lawyers. So uh, as you know, teachers of so-called podium or doctrinal classes, what should we be doing to support our students as professionals? Well, Kendra, please, Kendra. We can keep playing chicken. Um, <laughs> uh, 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 are all too professional to go first, but I went first last time, so I actually will insist that somebody else goes first next time. Doc, you're unmuted, so I thought you were about to, to jump in there. Okay, um, so I'll go back a little bit. I think it starts from your syllabus, right? Like, what are you saying about what's important? Um, are you saying, you know, uh, and so what are you defining as important to the class in that? Are you defining the way discussion is handled in a way that treats, you know, and thinks about other students' perspective and think and treats other students with respect? You know, what does your first day of class look like? What norms are you setting around 
um, discussing things with colleagues? What norms are you setting around the way that you're addressing students and what questions you're asking them? And I think that really that's um, that's a key part of the profession, right? So that that you know you think about that first day of one L where what that faculty member does on that day is the model that those students have of what a lawyer is, right? And so those norm settings around expectations in the class around your what your syllabus looks like, about what it's attentive to and what's not it's not said in there um, matters tremendously for what students learn from us about what it is to be a professional. Um, and so I, I'll stop there. Yeah, I mean, I think um, I, I completely agree with that. And I, I think both in the clinical setting and the doctrinal setting, there's a question of trust. Um, and when I think about, um, you know, how people can interact with each other across very different backgrounds um, with very different um, priors and th things like that, it's by establishing trust, you know. So one of the things I tell my students is this this will only this this will not be recorded because I want uh, and I think it's important to have trust for people to take risks and and be candid. Um, and so and so, you know, developing that environment, I think is really important. I, I also think that in doctrinal course, explicitly talking about um, how lawyers operate um, within that space. Uh, uh, in, in ways that harm or help the public interest is really important as well. Um, and in addition, um, how ethical ethics rules and 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 the, the attended questions around morality and doing the right thing, um, um, how lawyers operate within that space um, around doing the right thing, right? So uh, when we talk about IP, when I taught IP, we didn't just talk about what the doctrine said. We also talked about how lawyers handle tricky ethical questions that come up, um, how those doctrines affect the public interest, how lawyers operate to um, support or undermine the public interest um, in arguing for different rules or for different um, uh, stakeholders in the IP system, right? But you could do that with, with, with any course. And I think that is a big part of it. And when you bring in, practitioners and when you do exercises, um, you can build that um, that aspect of the discussion in as well. So that's kind of one, one that's my contribution. Yeah, I think I struggled a little bit with this question because I think in some ways, like one of the challenges is asking every teacher to do everything in every class, right? And I think that like there can be a real, like there's a real barrier, right? To being like, oh yeah, like people should integrate more discussion of professionalism into doctrinal classes in part because like many law school faculty do not operate sort of professionally as attorneys in the doctrinal classes they take. Like some certainly do, but many do not, right? And like, so I, you know, I want to like temper expectations a little bit. Um, but I was actually struck by actually something that I remember happening to me in law school um, in a doctrinal course. It was, it was, I believe it was evidence. Um, well, I know it was evidence and we were talking about rape shield laws, um, a recipe for things going great. Um, and I remember I had put up my hand to ask to say something and then the professor is like, let's stick with you. Um, what would you, you know, what would you say in response to that? And I was like, I, you know, or like, what would you, your counter argument to the argument you just put me? And I was like, I don't want to answer that question. And he was like, well, I'm asking you to put on your like, you know, defense attorney hat or whatever and answer that question. And I was like, I'm not going to wear that hat. And then that he moved on, which was nice um, because that was not an argument that was going to go well in front of the rest of my 75 peers um, for anybody. But I think back on that moment, not because, and like, I think my snarky response, if I had been sitting in that seat as the person I am now, as opposed to the person I was then was like, where's my retainer level letter, who's my client, right? Like what stage of the like case are we at? You know, is this, you know, like in some ways, what is really challenging about parts of professionalism and sort of professional norm development in doctrinal courses around, especially like, you know, how to like think like a lawyer or how to do law 
is the way in which we expect that independent of the norms that actually come with that work in practice, right? So being asked to sort of put yourself in the shoes of taking on an argument because, you know, that there is this idea that in order to think like a lawyer, you have to be able to articulate all sides of an argument, but in the absence of any actual like idea of representing a client, right? Which is the context in which actually you do have to potentially think about all sides of an argument. So I think when, you know, to get this sort of maybe a little bit back to the sort of professionalism component, I think that asking folks to engage in certain specific forms of kind of professional expectation, absence the broader like norms or circumstances in which they would do that in practice can actually be quite sort of harmful and artificial, right? And it, um, so I, what I would offer is that I think that I actually really agree with what Jack was saying about sort of like actually talking about how people in a particular like area practice law, right? Um, you know, how it is made and what people do, I think feels like a valuable way to engage in sort of a conversation, but also just to think about, you know, how we've already talked about like how naming the, the thing that you're doing is valuable, right? And that like most doctrinal courses are artificial spaces that have very little to do with practice in that place. And that's not actually necessarily an indictment. Right, like I think that that can sound like a criticism, but sometimes like that's the reality of how how do you teach all of First Amendment law in one semester? Well, you can't, so you're going to make some decisions about how to do that in a way that is like meant to meant to sort of enable particular things, and that sometimes the attempts to bring particular kinds of professional norms into those environments that are already so artificial. Um, ends up sort of being a way in which people uh, assert a particular kind of control over like their expectation in the classrooms. And I'm thinking about things like the sort of um, tradition of like using last names, like, you know, Ms. or Mix or Mr., you know, whatever, Albert or Learner or Tushnet um, or Thomas, right? Where, because, oh, the professor also goes, you know, you're Professor X, so I, I call people by last names, which is one of the rationales I remember hearing about for why not using first names in law school. And it's like, but like no one's under the impression that you're actually going to remedy the power dynamic by like uh, calling people by last names. So I think what I would offer in terms of the professionalism front is just to, you know, uh, like agreeing with my colleagues, but also to note that there are are ways to demonstrate care and sort of a professional identity development, but that don't rely on a particular set of like artificial requirements around like specific actions in class, which I think actually when people do that under the guise of a sort of professionalism rationale often end up just kind of uh, indicating a way in which the entire edifice is so abstracted away from like the actual reality of practice. Um, so I, you know, that's sort of my, my thought and my caution. Well, thank you. So we're close to the end now. So any departing words of wisdom uh, from, from any of you all, uh, if, if, I, if someone takes one thing away if, or if they were to try one change, what would you want it to be? Well, for me, care, not respect is, is I think, a really incredibly powerful frame. Um, and, you know, in, when my initial comments, when I was talking about respect, um, then I was listening to Kendra, and I actually was thinking that's, that's actually what I meant, because, because respect for the institution just for the, just for the sake of respecting the institution isn't that helpful. Um, I, I, I guess my, my parting words would be um, a lot of this does revolve around respect and care for the people you're working with, even if that's someone across the table. Um, and in order to be effective, I think establishing trust is hugely important, right? And I think that's a big part of professionalism. There are so many ways to establish trust, but ultimately that gives us the room to make mistakes, that gives us the room to give feedback, that gives us the room to be creative. Um, and when you have trust in that, in that setting, whether it's a clinic team of two or three students and a professor, or whether it's an entire classroom of 150 people, um, building trust in that group uh, is really important. All right, well, I'm gonna thank everyone uh, so much uh, for their participation. And like I said, uh, this will be up 
uh, on the HLS website, and hopefully uh, you can share it uh, as an example of uh, your, your professional accomplishments, and uh, other people will be able to get the benefit of it. Um, thank you so much, and, uh, I, and I look forward to seeing you again. Thank you, Rebecca. Thanks, everybody.